Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another ICBA cast live on Facebook and available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. I'm Jordan Bateman, the uh, Director of Communications for the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association, joined by Chris Gardner, President of ICBA. Chris, it's been a heck of a week. It's been a long week. There's a lot that's going on this week. It's been the kind of week where I think you and I should take three days off to recover. That's a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> all right. Well, happy Canada Day, first of all, to everyone out there watching uh, in Facebook land. I uh, uh, hope you have a great long weekend. It has been a busy week. Um, just looking over my calendar, I mean, we can go back uh, a few days here. Uh, this week, uh, we've come up against the uh, deadline for when groups can uh, spend money to talk about proportional representation uh, under David Eby's regulations. July 1st, no more, uh, no more third-party groups unless you are... Uh, taking money in by $1,200 increments for individuals, no more, and disclosing all your advertising, spending all that. So we've been busy this week putting out some material. We've put out uh, four proportional representation videos uh, trying to help people understand uh, the uh, lack of wisdom of switching to that mm -hmm. particular system. Uh, we've run 27 full-page ads in 27 newspapers across British Columbia uh, in rural uh, BC. Uh, to try to show them what their riding maps may look like, and there's been great feedback to that. And then uh, the big one, um, yesterday afternoon, we filed a uh, court petition asking for an injunction to stop the prop rep referendum. Chris, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's amazing how much activity has gone on on the, uh, the discussion around the proportional rep rep representation referendum. Easy for you to say. Yes, um, but listen, we went into BC Supreme Court, we had a 49-page petition, and we basically said, listen, whether or not you support proportional representation, the process is fundamentally flawed. It's been, there's been no consultation with British Columbians. Uh, there's been, there's, it's been rushed. Uh, the questions are confusing, and British Columbians are limited from having a full, open debate on the implications of changing the way we elect a government. This is not just another government policy. Mm -hmm. This is a fundamental change in our constitution, and it's something that has to be thought through carefully, debated fully, in a fair and open way. And the question has to be clear. This question is not, not clear, it's confusing. And we think, we think British <coughs> Congress are being shortchanged, and we think that the NDP government, John Horgan and David Eby, have really uh, tilted the scales to get the outcome they want, which is proportional representation. Yeah, so let's go back in history a, a little bit here. We'll start with the uh, Quebec succession vote. Yeah. Uh, if you recall, I think it was 50.1%. Uh, yeah. 50.1 to 49.9, Canada stayed together. After that, the Supreme Court of Canada said, look, you guys can't break yeah. up a country. You can't make you know, constitutional changes on a bare majority basis. That's right. Only if you have the clear will of the people, which most people interpret as 60% plus, and if the folks voting are voting on a clear question, that's right. we believe that's where the Clarity Act comes from federally. We believe that this violates those uh, constitutional principles, which were reinforced by the Supreme Court of Canada. Yeah, and, and the Supreme Court was very clear. Mm -hmm. The question has to be has to be clear, easily understood. Voters have to understand what they're voting for or against, and the majority has to be compelling. It's not just 50% plus one. And if you look back, when electoral reform was debated and discussed and voted on in British Columbia in, in 2005 and 2009, there was a high threshold and it operated on two levels. First, you needed 60% of all the voters <coughs> to support change and you need 60% of the ridings to achieve that level. And in both cases, it failed. But there's a reason why you need a high threshold. You don't just every five or 10 years change the way you elect a provincial government. This is fundamental. This is really important to our democracy. And the discussion should be very clear in terms of what, what British Columbians are debating, what the choice will be before them. And the question should, be, uh, should not be confusing. And everyone should have a chance to participate in the debate. In this, in this referendum, um, the campaign period starts in the middle of summer. It's summer it's starting. July 1st. Yeah. yeah it, it, so no one's really going <coughs> to be thinking about this till July, till September. And then they're going to have six weeks in the ballot. The, the mail-in ballot's going to arrive on the doorstep. People may yeah. miss it. They may be confused. There's three different choices. There's not enough information about what proportional representation is. It is it, the, the system's been rushed and it's been rigged, mm -hmm. and it's not fair to it's not fair to British Columbians. Yeah, so we're challenging on a number of counts. First of all, the uh, false choice between an existing system, which is very 
you know, well-defined, and this nebulous principle of proportional representation. There's no such thing as a proportional representation system. That's why they have three on the yeah. second question. There's hundreds of proportional representation systems, many of which only exist in, prop, uh, in political scientist minds, like two of the ones on this right. ballot. But, you know, so you're comparing like an apple, not even to an orange, you're comparing an apple to a Hyundai. Like it, you're talking about like a completely different kind of choice. So first of all, that's not a clear question. Yeah. Second of all, you have to rank three systems in order. Uh, that's a problem because no one's ever heard of these three systems. The materials that uh, will be released will not be adequate to educate folks. Um, two of them, like I said, only exist in the mind of David Eby that's and right. some political scientists. They don't exist anywhere on Earth, so you can't go to a country and say, oh, this is being run by rural urban. Um, one of them, we believe, actually violates the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedom because it has essentially two different electoral systems running in the same province. You can't do that. Um, there's a whole range of problems uh, with this, uh, with this whole thing. And it comes back to look what the reporters, what the media have been saying all along. Yeah. David Eby stacked the deck on this. He has rigged the system to try to get this through. And they're rushing it out. We can talk about the campaign period. Chris and I have worked on many campaigns. Um, you know, there was the federal campaign that was over a summer. The media said that is not a good idea. Yeah. The experts said that is not a, a fair thing. We have this one that starts July 1st, runs through the summer. In September, you're going to start municipal election campaigns because we vote for every mayor and councillor in this province on October the 20th. And then October 22nd, poof, you know, the ballots go in the mail and we have to start voting on this. Like, you know, it just it boggles the mind that uh, they would think this is fair. Um, yeah, yeah, it's rushed and it's not fair. What the government should have done is consulted more broadly, had an extensive period of review. And Come then, up with one system. Well, yeah, one system, one choice, clear question, and put it on the next on the ballot of the next provincial election. That's exactly. what they should have done if they wanted to be fair, open, and honest, and have a, have a real debate. But they can't do that because Andrew Weaver holds the keys to the premier's office, and he has John Horgan over a barrel. Yeah, no. So it's uh, it's not fair. Yeah. It's not open. It's not democratic, and um, and the consequences are quite significant. If we do adopt um, a system of proportional representation, uh, look at what's happening in some countries, particularly in Europe where you get fringe parties of, uh, on the left and the right um, electing members to parliament, to the legislature. Uh, all of a sudden, they're involved in a discussion to form government with a coalition yeah. of parties. I don't think it's going to help our democracy to have fringe extreme parties involved in those discussions. Yeah. And then you have, um, take a look at Italy, 66 governments in the last 72 years. We've had 22 in Canada. Would Canada be better off economically or socially if we had 44 more governments over the last? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <coughs> no, thank you. Yeah. No, and you know, this week we had the former pre prime minister of New Zealand come in and talk glowingly about the system. Um, I I'll give you guys a little, uh, a little pro tip here. Um, politicians will always talk glowingly about the system that got them elected. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, it got her in power, so she thinks it's fantastic. The person who brought it into, into place says it's actually hurt New Zealand. It's told Jean Chrétien it was the worst mistake he ever made was uh, foisting this system upon New Zealand. And, you know, the, hypo like, the hypocrisy of the, pro the prop rep people just astounds me, right? Like, they're criticizing Bill Good for wanting a fair referendum thing, saying he shouldn't be allowed to commentate on that. Gary Mason, a Global Mail columnist, is the host of this event with the New Zealand uh, Prime Minister saying, oh, prop rap is warm and fuzzy and wonderful. Yeah. Like, the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand said, you know, okay, well, so what if uh, Germany has 90 neo-Nazis in Parliament? Shouldn't neo-Nazis votes be uh, counted and included in the whole thing? No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they should not okay. be. Like, yeah. This is a pretty easy answer. I don't yeah. know what is going on yeah. here. We're on a slippery slope. <laughs> I just want to, like, I just do not understand what they're trying to do. Hopefully, um, the court uh, will hear our petition uh, soon, yeah. and 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 uh, hopefully we get a decision that's positive. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting, and um, uh, hopefully we hear soon. We're not saying don't do it. We're saying do it right. That's, that's right. what we're saying on that. Yeah. So, prop wrap that is uh, available icbaindependent.ca if you want to see our news release and our 49-page court filing. Um, and our videos. And, and our, our videos. videos. Yes, and in fact, if you want to uh, know more about prop rep, icba.ca slash stop prop rep. Take you to a great website. All yep. the links to our videos and other material will be there. And that reminds me, I've got to put this court case up on that website too. Okay, good. All right. Great. One more thing to do before the long weekend. Uh, what else have we done this week? This week we also launched our, uh, what I think is my, my favorite video we've done here so far at uh, Yes, at we ICBA. should have showed it. Actually, nah, they, they can see it on their Facebook page, yeah. uh, facebook.com slash the ICBA. 
Uh, by the way, ICBA, uh, we represent um, about 2,300 construction and small businesses across uh, British Columbia. We care about two things, construction and responsible resource development. And to do that, we know, and this is why we're getting involved in Prop Rep, uh, we know that it takes a strong, thriving economy. Those only come with stable, uh, intelligent governments. Yeah. And so we make no apologies for being the toughest advocacy organization out there for free enterprise. Uh, that's why we do the ICBA cast. Today, a quarter million British Columbians got up. They went to work in construction all over this province, uh, building the infrastructure, building the homes that uh, we so uh, are, are so grateful to enjoy. That's 9% of the provincial economy. Yeah. But yes, uh, one of the things that we are on is our contractors, think of the plumbing contractor, think of the electric contractor. They can't just hop on a SkyTrain with their tools and materials. They have to drive. And one of the big costs that they're facing is the continually uh, increasing vehicle costs because of gasoline, gasoline prices. So we launched the uh, big ass uh, gas campaign. Uh, if we wanted to, well, it's it's our it's our funniest video by our, far. Yes, uh, it, I, I'm not going to say it's gone viral, but it's getting a lot of fifty thousand views in its first twenty four hours. Yeah, so that's exceptional. Yeah, and. Um, and it's very it's funny. On, it's so been on the news hour, it's been on breakfast television. Yeah. I heard it was on CBC Radio. And you were on the front page of the province. Today. I was on the front page of the province today. So go out and buy your Vancouver provinces if you can find any. I'm sure they've sold out. I think they've sold out. They've all yeah. sold out. Yeah, we're going to auction off some signed copies. Exactly. We'll get on that. We'll get on that. Um, no, the funny thing about this campaign is, I mean, we've had this video done for about a week, uh, and we we decided that we were going to launch it on the Thursday before the long weekend because yeah. we knew gas prices spike. Um, on before every weekends. long weekend. Yeah, before every long weekend. So, you know, we talked about putting it up before BC Day. We didn't want to wait that long. We said we'd do it before Canada Day. Um, and it, we had two kind of thrusts. One is cutting gas taxes yeah. to make gasoline cheaper, but also to increase the gas supply. You know, build the pipeline, you know, get more gasoline and oil and gas products into the lower mainland. Pretty simple. We posted this video uh, on Facebook. 15 minutes later, Twitter goes crazy because out of the blue, the province, for John Horgan's given permission to the Translink mayors to increase the gas taxes by a cent and a half a liter. So Chris and I basically, it was like having the winning lottery ticket. We just yeah. happened to have this video ready to go. Quickly rewrote the campaign to uh, go after John Horgan for this latest tax increase. You know, took down the post, re, uh, rewrote the uh, intro to it, yeah. and put it back up. And now 50,000 views in 24 hours. But um, thank you, John Horgan, for uh, doing this on uh, the most possibly convenient day for us. Well, and you know, it's so disingenuous of the province to to give the mayors the power to do that because who would be, surprise, surprise, the mayors increase the tax. Yeah. Like, no, everybody knew that was It was happen. a secret deal. It was yeah. a secret deal. Yeah. We've had, we have not talked about anything in this region more than we've talked about these three, you know, TransLink projects. We had a whole referendum on it, on giving them a sales tax. We've talked about this for years. Gasoline tax was never back on the table until you know, two nights ago when John Horgan made the midnight deal with the uh, TransLink mayors. The TransLink mayors, two-thirds of whom aren't running again or don't expect to win again in the yeah. fall, were more than happy to pass this tax on to us. Well, you know, uh, local, raising local taxes to uh, TransLink mayors, I mean, they are addicted to taxes. They have not seen a tax they didn't like. They have a hydro levy. So check your hydro bill, you're paying TransLink tax. Every time you park somewhere, you're paying a TransLink tax of, I think it's 25% now. Uh, building a place, development cost charge now for TransLink. Uh, you have your fares. Get on the SkyTrain, obviously you're paying a fare. Gasoline taxes, now 17 cents a liter, soon to be 18 and a half cents a liter. Thank you, John Horgan. Like, you have all of these taxes. Like, you know, I've talked to leaders of other transit systems out there. They would kill for even half of these tax tools. Mm -hmm. These guys have all of them and they still want more. It's, it's really the beast that eats money. Are you suggesting that John Horgan isn't focused on affordability? Well, yeah, if this is me, you make a life more affordable, John Horgan. Stop! I can't take any more affordability. It's like Donald Trump. I'm tired of winning all the time. Please, I can't take it anymore. Um, yeah, this just completely erodes their claims of affordability. Um, it's yet another uh, cost driver, not just when you go to the pump, but you know, every good, every service in uh, this region moves at some point by gasoline. It's going to drive up the cost. And we are already at record highs, $1.60 a liter expected this weekend. Um, it's just bad news all around. Yeah. And it comes on top of their carbon tax increase every year of 1.1 right. cent. Yeah. No, so. it's ridiculous. So get ready. April Fool's Day, 2019, unless we vote these jokers out, we're going to get a 2.6 cent a liter gas tax increase in the lower mainland. It's pretty depressing.
and that's why we, we released the video. That's why we took the stand. Big ass problem. And yeah, we we have got you know people have to speak up when taxpayers are under pressure, and mm -hmm. you know governments generally don't. You know, they, every time there's an opportunity to raise to raise taxes, they'll find a million programs or a million yeah. reasons why we, they need more revenue. Yeah. This gas tax will generate about $30 million for TransLink. That's a rounding error in the multi-billion dollar budgets of Vancouver, Surrey, the 21 municipalities, uh, TransLink itself, and the regional district. They could find this money if they reprioritize their spending, but they don't want to do it. The one, the one thing that I thought was interesting yesterday was the mayor of Maple Ridge, mm -hmm. Nicole Reed. She's uh, not running for re-election. She's a, a lame duck. Yeah, had the courage to stand up, vote no, and, yeah. and speak loudly and say this is ridiculous. Yeah, and she's she's right. And she was uh, opposed to the sales tax as well. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> one of only three mayors who were opposed to the sales tax back in the day as well. So, yeah, good for Nicole Reed. She's uh, you know, very reasonable person. She'll be missed uh, yeah. uh, by a lot of us around the region. But, yeah, it's... It's frustrating. And, uh, let's go one, one other step here. I mean, obviously we're a construction association. Chris, I have grave doubts that TransLink's going to be able to do everything they say they're going to do within the $7.4 billion envelope they claim. They won't be able to do that. We number, know that won't happen. Number one, Lynn, we can talk about this in a second, they're going to have these uh, idiotic com uh, community benefit agreements, PLAs, yep. which they're going to drive up labor costs. And number two, uh, we know that thanks to uh, what's happening uh, down south, that we have new steel tariffs in place. It's going to drive up the cost of steel. Think of the rebar you need to tunnel under Broadway. Like, this, this particular ingredient in construction is going to shoot up 20 or 25%. Yep. There's going to be a shortage of it in all likelihood. They cannot build these things for $7.5 billion. Yep. And the cost of rebar will go up, and it will also impact the price of housing. Yep. So right across every a community center, um, condos, uh, uh, SkyTrain projects, it's, it's, yeah. it's going to be significant. The the well, talk about Horgan's demands that they do these PLAs, because that's an important component in these costs. Well, you know, project labor agreements, which they're calling community be benefit agreements, uh, really are uh, a veiled way uh, of basically the NDP rewarding their building trade union Whoa, supporters. The NDP rigging a system? Didn't they do that with yeah, Park Rep? I gotcha. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a pattern. So basically, look at it this way. The Patella Bridge is a $1.5 billion bridge. 13% um, of the workforce is formally organized by the building trades. That is the group that John Horgan has said, and he's been very clear on this. We're not yeah. making this up. He's no. gone out, he's publicly we have video. said to uh, different groups, has said the Patella Bridge replacement will be built by union only labor. That's ridiculous to say you're going to take tax dollars, 1.5 billion of them, and direct them to a 13% sliver of the construction workforce. Yeah. That's wrong, it's not fair. You're denying opportunities to the other 85% of the men and women in construction who are not affiliated with the building trades, maybe affiliated with different unions, may have employee associations, maybe non-union. It's not fair. And what we would say is um, the government shouldn't be picking and choosing people, uh, companies to build new roads, bridges, community centers, whatever the project is based on and whether or not the workforce is unionized or not. They should be having criteria that say which company has the experience, the expertise, can do it for the best value for taxpayers. Those companies should be the ones that win these projects. Um, so what they're doing with community benefit agreements is going to end up hurting the taxpayer and uh, it's gonna cost opportunities for, uh, for the men and women in construction who aren't affiliated with 13% of the unions that represent that, that sliver of the workforce. Yeah, just think about your own business. If you could only uh, get bids from 13% of the uh, overall market, uh, chances are those bids are going to be a lot higher. So that's uh, the bad news there. And then steel rebar, is get, again, as we spoke about, that will drive up the costs as well. So um, buckle up for more tax increases, perhaps, right. to pay so for it's cost coming. overruns. Yeah. It's all coming. Yeah, it's the all dark storm clouds are ahead. <laughs> the gathering storm, yes. as uh, Winston Churchill once famously said. Yes. Uh, but let's talk about uh, one happy thing on the way out. Canada Day this weekend. It's going uh, to be great. Uh, Chris, you got any big plans for Canada Day? You know, um, I'm going to, no, not really. I'll be uh, I'll Will be. you jog drink a Canadian beer? Uh, I will, yes, I, of course. Well, there you uh, go. And I'll be jogging on the seawall a few times. All right, um, there you go. And... Uh, Going to go to Langley and have some waffles and strawberries. Yep, it's going to be good. We uh, have some uh, family plans. In fact, 
Uh, the kids and I are going to go try out the new Aldergrove pool, a uh, big project unveiled by the Township of Langley this week. Okay. It's a half outdoor pool with like big water slides and stuff right. like that. It's a big deal for Aldergrove. If you have a family, you're looking for something to do this summer uh, with the kids, take them to the new Aldergrove pool. It'll be worth your, it'll be worth your while. What okay. do you mean? I should work for Tourism Langley. Yeah, you should. Just in general. Yeah. I'm like Mr. Langley. I should just work for them. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it for us. Have a happy Canada. Be safe. We'll see you next week. Uh, we have more to come. Don't worry about us. We've got, uh, there's always another fight for us to uh, pick with the NDP. Yeah. Uh, we'll definitely talk to you again soon. Happy Canada Day.